But your flaggy cow won't get you into heaven anymore. They're already all overcrowded from your dirty little war. Now Jesus don't like killing, no matter what the reason is for. And your flaggy cow won't get you into heaven anymore. Well, I went to the bank this morning. Said to me, if you join the Christmas club, I'll give you ten of them flags for free. Well, I didn't mess around a bit. I took them up on what he said, and I stuck them stickers all over my car, and one on my wife's forehead. But your flag to cow won't get you into heaven anymore. They're already overcrowded. So filled with flags I couldn't see So I ran the car upside the curb Right into a tree By the time they got a doctor down I was already dead And I never understand Why the man Standing at the pearly gate said Oh, you're a flag to cow I'm from St. Andrews, New Brunswick. I've been building for about 12 years. Uh, in this particular case, what was involved in building this boat was first getting the lines, and this is actually a replica of an old uh, turn of the century design. 1902 to about mid 20s. These I were see. built by at least two companies, E.M. White down in Maine and uh, Chestnut Canoes up in Canada. So we actually took the lines off of the chestnut version and built our own mold, which is slightly bigger, yeah. and just started from there. Built new, new mold, new patterns, and uh, and uh, came up with our own version of the boat. This is a wood plank boat, which is sheathed in epoxy glass mm -hmm. and painted with two-part uh, primers and, and linear polyurethane paints. So it's basically a wooden hull mm -hmm. sheathed in, in epoxy. I it's think. a two-layered hull. There's actually, a, you can see the, the inner hull comes up about here, okay. and the outer hull is built outside it, which, okay. which forms an air chamber, which is called a sponson, and that's why they were called the invisible sponson canoe. Ah, how many people does this canoe hold? Uh, we've had about six people in it. Six people? Yeah. Well, I built this for a fellow from Pennsylvania, and he uses it down there. He uses it in St. Michael's, Maryland, on Chesapeake Bay, and he's used it in the Finger Lakes. Uh -huh. And he also has a, a cottage up in Maine, and it comes up and gets used up up here for about a week out of the season. Okay. This particular boat is electric powered. Underneath the stern seat, there's a little electric motor, and there are batteries under the fore deck and under the after deck, and uh, and uh, just a throttle control under the console there. And how long can you run it with the electrical? Yeah. Uh, it depends on, on how fast you go. Uh, as for every mile an hour faster that you go, it uses about twice as much power. But going at three miles an hour, you can run this boat for about 36 hours before charging. Uh, running it at uh, five and a half miles an hour, you can go for about nine hours before a charge. So plenty of time. Lots of time, yeah. yeah. And that depends entirely on how many batteries you put in. We settled on, on eight batteries. I see. Okay. Well, David, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate nice you coming talking to you. By. Nice talking to you.
your name? Hi, my name is Martha Chessy. I live in southern Maine in the town of Shafley, down um, inland from Wells Beach, about uh, 18 miles inland from Wells. Been making about 20 years now. All, all different shapes and sizes of reed baskets. Um, these are made of reed and doing the Adirondack style, which is a pot belly styled basket. Uh -huh. And um, this is my second year in the fair, and it's just a wonderful, wonderful place to come. These are a lot of people use them for hiking. The basket. For yes, for hiking, for um, ice fishing. And we've got some just a little prop here with some ice fishing traps in here, and um, a lot of people. I actually just sold one to someone who's going to carry their dog in, <laughs> and they have a very small dog that they're going to carry in it. Yes, from Ohio. <laughs> I have been making baskets for about 20 years now. Started through adult ed programs, which I, I teach in Southern Maine now through adult ed programs. And um, so about 20 years, it was one craft that that definitely stuck with me and enjoy doing. I'm doing a demonstration of one of the larger pack baskets. And there is a different size reed that you need and it is soaked in. I have a bucket of water over here. And it's a matter of setting up your base, measuring well, and then starting your sides. And I'm tried to bow this out a little bit to make the pot belly effect on the front and at this point I'm I'm uh, bringing it in using a bit of colored reed there's a um, this is a dyed reed with grit dye and excuse me this is a um, a smoked reed this does come but I have to dye dye the colored reed and make it up to a certain point and put a, a rim on it and let's go Go from it's there. Ready to go. Yes. <laughs> the baskets will last indefinitely. Um, Not a, it's a good time, a good good idea, a couple times a year to spritz your baskets. I do stain all of my baskets with an oil-based stain, and um, a couple times a year, it's a good idea to, to spritz them or mist them. I even take mine out and hose them right down. It's a good idea to put some moisture back into your baskets because it, it is a porous material mm -hmm. and um, they need a, a little bit of moisture in there. every now and yes. Excellent. Sure. Well, I thank you very much. Well, I appreciate it. And, thank you. Uh, I don't have Hi, I'm Karen Cornell. And I'm from Anson, Maine, and I have a farm named Crow's Rise Farm. I raise angora rabbits, yes. and spin, and knit, and I shear people's sheep for them, and um, spin llama, wool, and, um, alpa and um, mohair, and angora, since 1987. I got into it by a friend of mine who has sheep, and taught me to spin, and I always was with rabbits when I was young, Yeah. and so I picked the rabbit to spin instead of sheep. And Angora from the rabbit I'm spinning. The wheel works, um, the wheel spins around and the flywheel is what twists it and then it pulls in by this um, uh, like drag uh -huh. and it pulls in and then I take the two pieces Ply them together so I have one yarn. I see. And then I can knit it. Well, then I wash it and then I knit it. I see. Okay. Yep. And I can spin it right from the rabbit. I don't shear the rabbits. I wait until they naturally shed. I see. And they shed every three months. I see. And so you collect the wool? Collect the fiber. The fur from them? I see. Yep. It's a fur. I designed this as a Sharpe. And it, this one is wool, llama, and alpaca, and um, angora with the wool. And um, I make lots of things that are blended or lots of things that are just natural angora. It's very comfortable. Fed your free arms, but it's just as warm, almost as warm as a sweater. Uh huh. This is an English angora, and I raised all the angoras. This one's only two months old, and it's a female. And they're a very docile, friendly bunny. As you can see, I can hold her and she doesn't jump around. I hold her for two hours at a time to comb them. They need to be combed quite often, once a week or so, and they shed every three months. And this is a little 
This is a little kitty bonnet I make and it's all Angora. For children, well, I make them for adults too. And it's very soft. Angora is the second softest fiber there is. It's also seven times warmer than wool. Very, even though it's very light and soft, it's very durable. Wash by hand. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Hello, my name is Kathy Shamel and I live in Grand Lake Stream. And I'm her husband Bill and I live here with her. And I'm Sophie Melanson and I'm from... This is Welcome to the Grand Lake Stream Folk Art Festival, our 10th anniversary. Um, this was started 10 years ago, uh, actually 11 years ago. It was an idea by business people in Grand Lake Street uh, to bring uh, people here to fill the camps and businesses to, because uh, the fishing is slow at that time. And uh, it's an alternative to the sportsman thing is to bring something here. And uh, I am a folk artist myself and, and travel around and so they asked me to be involved far as because uh, I knew a lot about the uh, artist viewpoint of it. We started this at 19, in 1994 by just having a, a group meeting around the table at the community building, the Chamber of Commerce at the time, and some businessmen and, and local people, and this is, this is what came up, is to have a festival. Well, the first year, we, we didn't know, which I think is very important, to in order to bring people here, we had to bring them from away, a long ways away, because we were trying to fill up the camp. So our target area, what we had to do, is to make sure that we could make people drive here from a long distance uh, and stay. But we had to have something very worthy to do it. So that was how we we decided on the quality and the music and all those things. So that's that's really how the this show began. We sat down and, and figured out what we would need to do to bring people from Boston and New Hampshire and whatnot here. We have 53 artists and of course our musicians and demonstrators and vendors of information booths and things. And so all in all I think we have about 70 people doing something or other around here. Artists uh, that want to join in and uh, become part of this. It's our 10th year and we had 17, I think, kids working for us this year. Maybe not that many, but close. We always, the only paid people who work for this festival are the teenagers. That's it. Everything else is volunteer. So we couldn't do this festival without the kids. Money that has been raised uh, goes back into the festival every year. There is no salaries paid out. None. What's good about it? Oh, what isn't good about it? Uh, the kids that work for us are exposed to so many things that they would never be exposed to. The people who come here are exposed to things that are very unique. Uh, the town is very unique, I think, because I grew up here, right. seventh generation in this town. Uh, the town is beautiful. The festival is beautiful and it enhances this town and it brings people in to support the businesses of this town. Mm -hmm. Not only this town, but all of North and Washington County. This, we had a real milestone this year. No electrical problems for the first <laughs> time in 10 years. No, it's quite an effort to put this, to put this up logistically. Mm -hmm. It all has to go up in a day. Uh, the tent vendor comes out of uh, Sussex, New Brunswick, commercial tent. And uh, with their crew of five and our crew of seven this year, uh, we had this thing up in 13 hours. And Sunday night, or to this afternoon at 5 o'clock, uh, they'll show up and we'll take it down and it'll be gone by about midnight. Really? So there's a there's a, a labor-intensive effort that goes into it. And that's what I take. Okay. Uh, we sure hope that, uh, the, that everybody in Maine and New England makes sure that they get their reservations made now for next year's festival, which is the July 30th and 31st, I think, but I better not say that. It's the last full weekend. Uh, and... The festival will be full of beautiful color and art and music and dance and food and it's 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 just a stupendous weekend, rain or shine, because we have tents. It doesn't matter what the weather is. We're all set. But please plan on coming. 
and get your reservations now as they book up fast and, and we can guarantee that it'll be a wonderful experience. Visually, music, everything. All your senses will be overloaded. Yeah. Promise. <laughs> okay. Thank you and be sure to see us on Channel 11, Down East TV.